the studious of beauty that is different by design. Up front, you'll... Uh, thank you for having me here today at uh, the Studebaker National Museum. It's really an honor. Um, first of all, uh, just a little bit of, so I don't raise everyone's expectations <laughs> uh, about what this lecture is about. Um, I'm not an engineer. From my introduction, I'm not a technician. This is not super technical, and it's a lot about larks and hawks, which I'm sure they have much better productions on already, um, or you can ask plenty of questions. The cars are essentially the same as the cars that were built here in South Bend in terms of the Hawks and the Lark. Um, so there's not so many technical differences, okay? I just want to get that out of the way, and, and I can't really answer very advanced technical questions on uh, the, the, some of the, but I will get into the few minute differences between the cars produced here in South Bend and in Israel. Uh, the second part is, this is not a talk about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict or the Israeli-Arab conflicts. I don't have enough time. There are plenty of other programs on this. This is a very focused uh, talk on how the car got there and how it left South Bend and how it left, eventually left Israel. Um, so that's basically what this talk is about. I don't want to go too far out of that because we could be here for decades talking and yeah. nothing will get resolved. Um, the, the third part of this um, is that this is not, there's another story that I could tell um, that's just about the Jewish American love of the Studebaker. That's another story I could come back someday and tell about how Studebaker was really popular with American Jews. This story is really not about that either. Okay, so, um, so I, I'm sorry if I just like choke away most of the people's questions here at the end, <laughs> at the beginning, but I just want to manage expectations so you don't walk away and think, well, geez, that's what I thought this was going to be about today, and he switched everything. Um, so, all right, so um, first of all, uh, a little bit about my organization, the Indiana Jewish Historical Society. This is our 50th anniversary. Uh, we collect, and we preserve, and we document uh, Jewish history throughout the state of Indiana. We've been doing so since 1972. Uh, you can check us out on the web at ijhs.org if you haven't already, or on Facebook. Um, I also, please check out all the wonderful things they're doing at uh, sudabakermuseum.org uh, and on Facebook, if, you're, if you probably haven't already heard about this program there. Um, so the first slide I'm going to show is a very familiar picture. Okay, is this working? Turn it on. Okay. The other way? Okay. Turn it on. And... Okay. Um, okay. So probably everyone's familiar with this picture, okay? And probably everyone has seen this picture. Um, it's a very sad picture. Raising hands, how many people have seen this picture before? I, I'm guessing every, almost everyone in this room has. And, and they know the context of this picture. Um, but I want to tell everyone, this isn't the end of the story. Um, there's a lot more, even, even beyond the Israel aspect. There are, there's a lot more about Studebaker. Um, so 1963, we see the plant closing. And so you're asking yourselves, you know, what are we really talking about? You know, the Studebaker plant is closed, and what is, what is there more to talk about? So this really brings us to our topic today of how on earth did the Studebaker get to Israel? And uh, I, I just, just, just wondering, you know, how many people think that, uh, and I, I don't, I, I'm not going to take offense, how many people do you think that they still rode camels in Israel back in the 60s and 50s, <laughs> or donkeys? No, seriously, because I've had people ask me questions like that. And yes and no. Yeah, um, the country wasn't very well developed. The roads weren't very well developed. The infrastructure wasn't very well developed uh, in the early 60s. Um, it was a country that uh, was not this, people think of this high-tech country with a high bunch of highfalutin uh, entrepreneurs and tech people and tech, no. This is a totally different country. This country we're talking about is a country that had just gone through a really large war, had taken a huge number of refugees, and uh, was mostly agricultural, 
and just starting to get into industry. So this is a country that basically had an economy that would look like uh, Yugoslavia during the Cold War at its best day. Um, this is not a first world country um, and it was not an industrialized country. So the idea of starting a car plant, if you went, to, went back in time and went to the 50s and said, hey, we're gonna start a car plant here, okay? We have, we have hundreds of thousands of untra completely untrained, traumatized refugees. We have really no industrial base. We really have no one to train these people. Um, and we don't really have anyone to loan us money. Like, how, are, how is this going to work out in the early 50s? I'm just putting, giving you perspective of how amazing the story is, because otherwise you're thinking, what's the big deal? This is the startup nation, you know, like, they just, like, invent stuff and it makes money, right? You know, I took ways to get here today, uh, the GPS system. Um, I'm sure everyone uses uh, Israeli technology. This didn't exist back then. There weren't, you know, tech gurus in Israel creating stuff. These were people working in agriculture, you know, working really hard, working the land. Um, so the idea that someone is going to start building cars in Haifa in the early 1950s, people would say, well, this, the, the, there's a word in German and Yiddish, it's called Luftmensch. It's their head, their head is totally in the clouds. This is not, this is not real. Um, this is some sort of dream. So um, to give you some perspective, Studebaker wasn't completely alien to the Holy Land. Um, the British actually introduced and sold a number of Studebakers uh, starting in the 1930s. So here's actually a, 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 a sign in the 1920s even in the British mandate period. So in the 1920s you can actually see a British ad for a Studebaker in Jerusalem. Uh, for sale. So this was in a car, that a brand that people weren't unaware of. People had seen these before, um, both Arabs and Jews. Um, and it was actually a popular brand, even before uh, Israel started producing them. So it wasn't a, an alien brand to uh, early Israelis. Um, but on the next slide, and there's another possible way that many Israelis may have heard about it was that um, people who served uh, in World War II on the East Front uh, through Lend Lease, uh, the US, you may have heard the story of how the US lended. It's a whole other story I'd love to tell someday. Totally unrelated to this, but just tangentially that the US sent uh, thousands of trucks that the Soviet Union called the Studebaker. And um, trading with the Soviet Union and with the Soviet bloc countries, keep that in mind because it's gonna come back later in our story. Um, so, where does it all begin? It begins with not one of Studebaker's best friends in the world, uh, the Ford Corporation. Um, so the Ford Corporation had a really wild idea. They thought, you know, Ford was expanding all over the world, expanding to Europe, expanding the Middle East, and they, they saw, oh, there was just a war there. Maybe we can start producing Jeeps and trucks and all kinds of other vehicles there. And I'm sure there's a market for them to buy it, both the Israeli government and the public. And, well, this attracted uh, the only person that could have possibly invested in this in this Israel, which was a man by, we'll introduce in a second, called Ephraim. Uh, Ephraim. Uh, and he is really, really big in this story, Ephraim Elon. Um, so what happened was, was that there was, after the war, um, the Arab nations decided to boycott Israel and they wouldn't let anyone do business with them, basically. And so Ford, when, when the Arab League got wind of this, they said, you know what, Ford, we're gonna blackball you out of the Middle East if you create this, don't do this. And Ford said, okay, you know what, I'm not gonna build that plant there, I'm not gonna take this risk, it's not worth it, it's not worth, this is not a hill worth dying on. Um, so. They pulled out, but the thought of putting that there into Ephraim Elon, who was the only, Israel's really, really only tycoon and Israel's first tycoon, he thought, maybe if Ford thinks this is possible, maybe this is real. So uh, Ephraim Elon, who you'll see here, um, he was born in uh, Kharkiv in Ukraine. Um, in 1912, and he came to, he, he came to Israel uh, at a young age. He came to the British Mandate of Palestine at a young age. 
And he became really well known for wheeling and dealing in the arms trade um, and getting around the embargo. And he was able to accumulate all kinds of weapons from Eastern Bloc countries in the 1948 war. Um, but through that reputation of being able to do deals, he became quite wealthy. He became uh, kind of Israel's first tycoon. And he was the only person who could have really invested the money. But the question is, and he acquired the, the arms from Czechoslovakia, for example, in, in the 1948 war. Um, the question on his mind was in creating this plant, since Ford pulled out, what next? Who should I go to next? And so what happened was, was that an opportunity presented itself in the form of, one second, I, I think I flipped this around. Um, so what happened was is that he first went to a company in Michigan, a competitor of Ford, uh, called uh, Kaiser Fraser. And Kaiser Fraser built Jeeps during World War II, and they had a huge plant, plant that was just basically fitting there empty. And they said, you know what, we're, gonna, we're thinking about opening up a plant in Greece, and uh, one of Ephraim Elon's friends picked up on this in England, and he said, you know what, if they're gonna open up a plant in Greece, maybe there's a chance that Kaiser Fraser might open up a plant here in Israel. And he said, wow, that's a great idea. So he met with uh, Kaiser Fraser in, in, Detroit, in Michigan, and they said, you know what, this is, this is great, we'll invest half a million dollars, but you gotta find two million dollars. So let's think about how much is two million dollars in, in Israel in the early 1950s. Let's do the math <laughs> for inflation on that. These are astronomical numbers. And who's going to loan this kind of money to someone from a country that most people have frankly never heard of uh, from uh, US banks? But you know, Ephraim Elon is a really remarkable person who just does not give up. He is persistent. He has this dream. And he's just, he goes to every single bank in Israel. He goes to every single bank in the United Kingdom. He goes to every single bank in the United States. And he, he's, he's got the $2 million. But then he's thinking, uh-oh, I have some doubts. What happens if I misappropriate this money and I lose $2 million <laughs> in the early 1950s? So he decides to go to um, a man who he knew in his childhood in Ukraine who happened to be uh, kind of his spiritual leader, uh, the Lubavitcher Rebbe in New York. And he flew there and he asked him, just like an episode from The Simpsons, you know, when they asked, you know, Bart asked, which kind of car should I drive for the rabbi? He asked, you know, should I invest $2 million in this car, like car company? Like, and he's like, he's, he's expecting, you know, maybe no. And he says, you know what, you should do it. And here's why, here's why you should do it. Because it's not just investing money in a car company. It's not just taking a big risk. This company that you're going to create is going to train thousands and thousands of people with skills that they never had before. A group of people who are essentially refugees from the Holocaust, or they had been tossed out of um, uh, Arabic-speaking countries recently, who had no jobs, no future, who were working uh, dead-end agrarian jobs. And give them the opportunity to actually learn a trade and learn skills, because this did not exist. This does not exist in Israel. There was nowhere you could learn all the skills it takes to run a factory. And anyone who has experience here who's related to someone who worked at Studebaker, I'm sure that your relatives took all the, all the things that they learned and applied them to other places that they worked at. So in a way, it's kind of, it, it's, it's kind of not just a story about the car, it's a story about the workers. It's a story about how Studebaker's legacy wasn't just in South Bend, but it was passed off to several different countries, Canada, Australia, Chile, South Africa, and Israel. So after, after the plant closed, so he acquires the money, he does the investment, and what happens next is that Kaiser Fraser, um, after a few years of success, they decide that they don't want to produce sedans anymore. They change their mind. 
And now what is he gonna do? This is his worst nightmare. So he has to lay off several, uh, several hundred workers and he goes to Renault and he thinks it's a done deal because they already started producing some Renault cars in their plant in Haifa that he invested the, the, mil, the half a million dollars from Kaiser Fraser plus the $2 million that he invested from his own money um, and his investors, obviously. And Renault, at the last minute, because he thought this is a done deal, like the CEO of Renault was Jewish back then, he thought he knew him, and the CEO of, of, <laughs> of Renault said, well, you know what, there's this problem with this Arab boycott, and they're gonna block Renault from being in the Middle East, and so I gotta say no. <laughs> so he lost the Renault deal. Now he's really, really nervous. <laughs> He's really, he's, cause he's like, okay, so Kaiser Fraser's gone, Ford is gone, uh, Renault is gone, like who's gonna take a risk? Who's out there who's, who, who's, who's, who's just like at the point where they're gonna say, we're gonna take any chance, we're gonna take a chance. And he found it in Studebaker Corporation because we all know the state that Studebaker was in, that they were trying a lot of different things and they're trying to be innovative and they were just really trying to stay open. And so he went on a tour. Uh, uh, Fry and Elon went on a tour of Studebaker in South Bend. And he took uh, a couple of different ministers. This is uh, from the South Bend Tribune. And he took several different Israeli ministers from the government there with him. And they sat down and he said, you know, I absolutely love Studebaker. And Studebaker said, you know what, we're willing to take a risk. We're going to do it. And, um, so you can see some of the different things that were produced simultaneously. So this in 1958, 57, they were producing uh, Willys Jeeps, Renault, and Studebaker trucks simultaneously uh, because he had already s had a small deal on Studebaker trucks. That's one detail that I, um, I didn't want to leave out, that he had already started a small relationship manufacturing a few Studebaker trucks. So there was already a little bit of trust there. You know, it wasn't such a wild ideal, uh, uh, deal. So uh, Elon, like I said, he came in 1962, um, and uh, he, he, he did the tour with a group of other uh, uh, foreign assemblers and dealers from around the world, uh, who eventually also, some of them also eventually started building Studebakers in their own countries. And here's a picture from the South Bend Tribune, <laughs> again, of them actually inking the deal. Um, uh, and, 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 oh, and, and agreeing to start building them in uh, Kaiser Illin Industries in Haifa. Now, now one of the things that, um, second here. sorry, I'm getting a little bit of pushback here. One of the things I want to say was that you know assembling cars for export. So you know why did they really want to produce you know the the Studebaker in Israel? Why were they so? Why would the local Israelis be so so excited about this? Well, one was that Israelis had to pay a huge colossal tax um, if they were like a VAT a VAT if they were driving a foreign car. So because the Studebaker was going to be built in Israel, they would have the benefit of driving a foreign car without paying that huge tax. So this made the Studebaker like, wow, this is an amazing deal because, you know, and Israel isn't produce, hadn't produced a car yet. So the first car that they're producing is actually an American model. And this is from the, uh, this is from the Jewish Post and Opinion. Uh, talking about the deal, it was all, at the time, it was really, really well covered in the news. Um, now, basically, we'll get into a little bit about the differences between a Studi the Studebakers in Israel and the Studebakers that are produced in the States, which I'm sure you're all really interested in. Um, so Israel, at the time, because of this embargo, they lacked some essential metal materials. And so they innovatively had to take the Lark body shell and they used fiberglass and a simplistic folded sheet metal stampings to actually make the body of the car, unlike 
the so solid metal uh, body that they, that they produced here in, uh, in the States. So that's one difference. And, I, and a few of them I've heard were actually made out of plastics, uh, kind of like the uh, Trabant, the East German Trabant that's made out of plastic. Uh, there's actually a joke about a later plastic made Israeli car, not this one, um, that uh, this car was actually eaten by camels was the joke, <laughs> they, because they would like to eat the, the, the fiberglass off of it. Um, okay, let's go to the next slide. So, and another, another interesting difference in terms of components. So, when Studebaker closed the plant in South Bend, Indiana in December 1963, they gathered all the parts and they put them into kits and they sent them to Canada, Chile, South Africa, Australia. Did I say Canada already? If I say Canada twice, it's okay. Um, and so they all had kits, but unlike the Canadian built Studebaker that was powered by engines uh, bought uh, from General Motors, the Israeli Studebakers were actually built with real Studebaker V6 engines. So this was, except for the body, this was exactly the same Studebaker as you would have driven in Indiana down to the nuts and bolts, okay? And they were able to, to basically take the same parts that, that they received and uh, replicate them. So the, the, there was no difference technically. If you know a Lark and a Hawk, it's the same car except for the body, okay? It's even closer to being more of an American car than the Canadian was one was, okay? <laughs> and this is pretty amazing for a group of people that had very little experience in terms of car building. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. So we see a, a wonderful picture of a tour through Haifa, you know, examining, the, or actually I think this is in this plant looking at, uh, it's, is it in Haifa or is it this plant? I think it's in Haifa, looking, examining uh, a lark. And uh, here's a postcard with the lark. Israel was so proud of having the Studebaker, let me tell you. Um, it was just really a source of pride and joy. Um, next one. So, um, so like I said, when the Kaiser Fraser uh, factory opened up, you can't imagine how many people were relieved to be able to finally find a job that they could build skills off of because it didn't really exist. And, and at least 3,000 initially were sold to the public and the Israeli Defense Forces. And Kaiser Elon in the 1950s, get this, they were able, and this is how small the Israeli economy was, their car exports actually made up 28% of the entire young country's GDP. So almost a quarter of all the money in Israel was coming from exports of selling either Kaiser, uh, Kaiser Fraser cars or selling Studebakers. That's how valuable the Studebaker, so there was a demand for the Studebaker. What does it say? There was still a global demand for the Studebaker in the early, in the early 1960s. And somehow Ephraim Elon was able to know that. He, some of the first countries he sold to was Finland, and he sold cars to South America, to Latin America, and he sold cars to Sub-Saharan Africa. So you, you know, many of the uh, Studebakers you see from the 1960s in Sub-Saharan Africa came from this plant in Haifa. Um, uh, because some of Israel's earliest trade partners were in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, we'll go to the next slide. So, so you can see, you know, just getting an idea of the kind of advertising campaigns, uh, what it would have looked like, and again, Israel had a tiny, tiny economy. So having a car like this come just wowed the public seeing this, you know, having this all-American brand and having the ability to buy it uh, without paying uh, international taxes was just amazing for them. And you can see from the engine, it's a Lark. <laughs> it looks just a lot like a Lark. There's absolutely no difference between the two. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. Um, and yeah, so everyone, everyone 
was driving the Lark in the 60s. And I'll, I'll point out who these individuals are of the eye patch. That's actually the Israeli chief of staff, General uh, Moshe Dayan. Maybe a few of you might know him. Uh, uh, driving through the, uh, near the old city of Jerusalem. So everyone, middle, middle class civilians, everyone was driving uh, Hoosier, in a, uh, we'll call it a Hoosier invention meets Israeli innovation here, okay? Or soon to be Israeli in, in, innovation, because it's really still Hoosier innovation. Um, so right here, we have, and actually in Australia, I actually also saw Australian uh, police larks too. So it wasn't only Israel that had uh, police cars that were built out of larks. Um, a couple of these pictures are actually right next to the uh, Israeli Knesset. Uh, one of them you can see actually see the Dome of the Rock. It's on, a, on the Mount of Olives. And you can actually find a few of these in uh, the Israeli Police Museum. Um, if you're really interested, if you're over there, if you ever happen to go there. Um, so I want to just give you an idea of like, what did Israel look like back then? So this is a country that doesn't really have great roads. It's, and it has all kinds of terrain. Israel has, if you've ever been to Israel, it has mountainous terrain in the north. It has flat land in the center. It has hot. It, it occasionally snows up in the north. It has all kinds of terrain. So, and this, the wonderful thing is that the Sudebaker lark and hawks that were in Israel had a wonderful record of being able to deal with the rough road conditions in Israel and the heat without burning out. So if you're wondering if, like, how did these cars do in this, these kinds of conditions, they did wonderful, they did great. Um, and this is an idea of like how dominant the Studebaker was. A lot of Israelis took public transportation back then. There weren't a lot of cars on the road. And you can see all these are, what are all these? What do you see here? They're all stars. <laughs> Instead of calling it a startup nation, they could, should call it the Stark nation back then. Um, so uh, here, what is this car right here? This is a modified Lark. Um, but not any modified Lark. It's actually the Lark that was modified for Israeli President Zalman Shazar um, for use in a parade in 1964. And this was the only time that he actually ever used this car. Um, so, Going in a little bit about this, um, beginning in 1963, several different Lark sedans were stretched to include a third row seating um, for use in taxi cabs. And these Larks were used, used two-door F-body rear quarter panels and were specially made uh, rear panel stampings for the factory correct look. Um, and this model, uh, was, like I said, I want to stress, this was only used for a very short period of time as the president's car. And one of the things that's really striking about this is that notice it's completely open. This is after Kennedy. So having a car that's completely open um, is a little bit strange for a president's car back then, um, I would say. Um, and here is actually a picture of... Um, Israel used to have, it doesn't anymore, used to have like military parades for its independence. And I, I want to say this is in Jerusalem. And you can see uh, President Shazar getting out of the hawk. Um, and the modified lark that he was given in this picture um, was only used once as well, and it was built out of plastics. So the Lark that they tried to build out of plastics in addition to the Hawk that they tried to build um, also sort of fell apart, <laughs> didn't turn out the way, and then they, they replaced it with a Lincoln Continental convertible. Uh, again, a convertible, which is strange uh, after Kennedy because most presidential cars and vehicles were going away con from convertibles. Um, and then maybe some people will notice who this person is. Who is this person? Anybody knows who that is? That's uh, Yitzhak Rabin, who was uh, a general in the, uh, in the Six-Day War and later Israeli prime minister um, twice. 
And this is in 1965. He's getting out of a brand new lark in this picture. And this is just to give you an idea that of, of everyone from you know, every class of society in Israel was driving Studebakers. Um, and it was a real source of pride. So like I said, these factories, they train tens of hundreds of workers that just had no experience in manufacturing. Um, many of them were Holocaust survivors. And you can see, here's an, here's an interior view of the factory. Um, here's some more advertising for, for the company. And then here's another, here's another like, idea of like, what the roads look like in Israel, like how diverse um, the air, different, different roads are there <laughs> that they had to traverse. Um, everything from you know, compact cities to mountainous areas to dirt roads. And it did well in all three. Go to the next slide. And then here's a picture of kind of city driving. Um, if you've ever driven in Italy, uh, Israel's kind of similar driving, I guess. Uh, it's not so easy. <laughs> and, and the lanes aren't so navigable. And you're trying to go around bus traffic. It's pretty much the same today, by the way, only worse. Um, and this is Tel Aviv. And um, you can see um, this is this is what this is how many Studebakers were on the streets in the early in the in the early to mid 1960s in Tel Aviv, in Israel. It's pretty remarkable. Now, um, people from Port Wayne probably might know who this person is, and yeah, he, he actually he was in South Bend too. Um, so uh, this is from. Uh, Mark Levy, who's originally from Fort Wayne, Indiana. He actually worked here in South Bend. He was actually a journalist here. This was actually his last spot. Um, and here's a quote from him. Fate had me living in South Bend, my last stop in the US. I was an anchor for the local CBS affiliate, 11 PM local TV news. Though the Studebaker factory shut down in December 1965, there were still many Studebakers on the city streets. I bought myself a 1963 model for about $125. It was supposed to get me from my house to the TV station and back, but after driving it for a couple of weeks, I realized that I had an absolute gem of a car. Once again, 10 years ahead of its time, I had a small V8 engine, 200, 289 cubic inches, <laughs> and then, how does this connect to Israel? How does this connect to Studebaker in Israel? Well, amazingly enough, he, uh, he soon moved to Israel and became a journalist in Israel as well. So driving my Studebaker sensibly, I found that I got 22 miles to the gallon of gas, which is exceptional back then, especially for a V8 with such potential power. And instead of just driving it back and forth to the TV station, I took a vacation trip to the East Coast to say goodbye to some of my friends, it was driving pleasure. Now, imagine if that car had been built in 1973 instead of 1963. In 1973 was the year of the Arab oil boycott. Gas prices soared. There was a run on smaller cars and with better fuel efficiency. And there was a vehicle that provided comfort fuel economy right under our noses. But 10 years too early. I moved to Israel in January 1972, and I thought my romance with Studebakers was over. Imagine my delight when I saw Studebaker larks on the streets here. It's amazing, huh? He, he can't get away from the Studebaker. He, 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 it's, it, there's a, there's a, a Hebrew term, beshert. He's married to the Studebaker. That's his second wife. Don't, don't tell her, though, I think. Um, all right, so don't tell them I said that joke, anyways. Um, but anyways, so the Lark and the Champ models were used extensively by the Israeli police, the army, the Mossad, all used the OHV six-cylinder engine. Um, it had no durability issues. And you, you can see, like, the climates in Israel are obviously different than they are in the Midwest. It gets much, much hotter there, dry or tropical. And the car endured. The, the, v, the V6 engine did very, very well there. Um, here's another police car. This, this car is actually used by the Navy. I don't know what its 
purpose is in this picture in the Navy, but it is. You can tell from the, uh, the front, from the uh, license plate. And um, here, you actually have some <laughs> nice little objects I actually found on eBay of all places um, uh, that are actually for um, driving instructors. So like when you went to uh, uh, learn how to drive, which is a big deal in Israel because you know it's like going to grad school, learning how to drive in Israel because there's uh, such harsh terrain and wild driving and few places to park. <laughs> um, so here you have a, a token that was given at the drivers. And, and in Israel, when you're driving around a car, it actually says, it actually, just like here, they, they put up a big sign that says uh, uh, driver in education. <laughs> so I, don't, I, did, I couldn't find a picture like that with a Sudebaker. I looked around. I wanted to find that. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, the beginnings of Studebakers in Israel um, sort of end. So fortunately, we have to come to an end at some point here um, in this story. So um, despite doing relatively well, in 1965, uh, the Israeli government made a really tough decision because their economy was shrinking at the time. Um, and they decided that they would actually cut money going into the plant. This was money that they needed, and they didn't expect to have these cuts. And then a year later, there was a recession, and then they had to really start cutting their production back. Um, and in November, um, they let 100, um, 110 employees go. Um, this is actually, this picture is actually right by the Israeli National Theater. If you're wondering, the building is actually the, um, the uh, Israeli National Theater, the Habima in Tel Aviv. Um, so between 1959 and 1966-1967, approximately 3,500 Studebakers were assembled by Kaiser Elon. Um, this may have been some of the last Studebakers built on Earth, although uh, one factory also was licensed to assemble Studebakers in Australia, which also hung on to producing until 1967. So there's a bit of a debate. I kind of have a primary source. I'd be very interested if there's someone from Australia that can compare sources and prove that they actually built the last one, because I haven't seen anything from Australia that proves that they produced one after Israel. So I'd love to see that because I've seen a lot of like stuff online about people claiming Australia was the last. Some people say that Israel was the last to produce a Studebaker. Um, so the dream of creating a Detroit in the Middle East failed. Uh, however, it inspired countless other Israeli businesses to take chances that would later make Israel's startup scene world famous. It was dreamers like Elon that pushed other budding business leaders to take risks that would be unimaginable by other business cultures. So Elon's efforts inspired Israel to try to keep on building. They tried to build the Susita car. Um, it was really awful. It was nothing even close to being as good as anything that was produced by Sudebaker in Israel. Um, that was the car that actually was eaten by camels, they claimed. That was a joke. Um, they, they continued building those until the 1980s. It was made out of uh, fiberglass. It was like a tri. It looked. It, it was. It was so bad. It would make the East German Tribunt blush if it saw it. Um, in uh, 2007, uh, Israel attempted to build electric cars with Better Place Company, and the company collapsed in, by 2013. So that was also a bust. So you know, as you can see. Post Sudebaker, Israel has not had a great record with its car industry, unfortunately, for them. Um, so I want to say um, the most prominent automobile um, historian in Israel today is Yohei Shinar. And he, 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 he sent me a document. And his, this document says in Hebrew that a, the last lark was delivered to the IDF on the 5th of November, 1967. And uh, he listed the license plate. And why is this interesting? Well, it's interesting for several reasons. That most likely the last lark was actually a military order. 
um, a car that most likely served in the uh, 1967 war. And, and it was assembled in the Kaiser Elan factory. Um, it, was, uh, it was most likely used as a staff car for a colonel or above. Um, on the 6th of June, uh, so that was on the second day of the sixth of, of the of the Six Day War. So on the second day of the Six Day War, the last Studebaker in the world was ordered and delivered. So that's that's pretty fascinating. Um, and he says uh, that I think the army needed more cars and re for reserve high ranks. The car bore the military number uh, eight. Uh, eight 18614, and in uh, 1973 and 1974, it was sold to civilian hands and got a new civilian license number. So that this, according to Benny Haspel, is probably, this primary source he provided to me in Hebrew, is probably proof of the last Studebaker ever built on Earth. So unless someone from Australia comes and proves me wrong, we are correct that this is the last Studebaker ever built on Earth. But I, I, seriously, I'm open to debate. If someone from Australia can produce that document and show it to me, this, this, this document in Hebrew is the last document for the last order of ever, any Studebaker ever built. Um, which, its backstory is fascinating. It was, it was delivered as a staff car for a colonel. So that just shows you how much it was trusted there in Israel despite the economic conditions that ultimately brought the company down. Um, so we're probably all familiar with this. And, and I, I wanted to put this in here because I, I, probably a lot of people are going to ask me you know, questions about, you know, did, uh, did uh, Jeff Newman and Dennis Lambert and Newman Altman company, did they, send parts to, did they send parts to Israel? And the answer is yes, they got some big orders in the 1980s, uh, according to them. Uh, but they're not a big part of the story, uh, other than delivering parts to Studebakers that were still going strong in the 1980s. Um, but if I ever did another program on, and, and they did their own program here only a number of months ago, um, uh, a wonderful program, I encourage you to see it, on, uh, on, the, uh, on the Newman and Altman Company, uh, and uh, their, 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 uh, their wonderful work. Um, so, Last, one, some of the last slides I promise were almost done. So these are just some of the sources that I used. And uh, special thanks to Mark Levy. Uh, I hope he doesn't watch this so he doesn't see all of my bad jokes. And Benny Haspel. So uh, thank you to them. And uh, I want to thank everyone for coming out here today. Um, and I want to know, I'm sure you guys have questions. If you guys don't have questions, I don't know. Different by design.